Welcome to the New Judge One Podcast. My name is Isaac Kamins. This is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess O'Brien and I discuss internal martial arts, qigong, and meditation. Uh, this week we turn to the Wu style of Tai Chi, uh, talking about both the founder, Chuen Yo, and his son, Wu Jin Chuan. A uh, little bit of history and some antics about them. Uh, then we turn to Baiwa's Tai Chi Classics, and we discuss a couple of different uh, concepts. The first being the idea of not swaying or slanting your body, and how this relates to the Zhang Ding or the central equilibrium. And the second is the well-known concept of double weightedness. And just a reminder, if you go over to the Patreon, you can hear an extended episode as well as our bonus episode, uh, which this week in the bonus episode, we discuss a uh, interview Bruce did in 2001 with the Chi Journal, and that was on the fire and water methods of Taoist meditation. Um, he talks about Leo Hong Jie's meditation and what he learned versus the quote unquote fire method. And then finally, we return to Baiwa's uh, Hunter Character Tablet discussion on internal alchemy. And we discuss the idea of white clouds gathering overhead, which is the um, part of the process of the microcosmic orbit. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. Hope you check out the Patreon. Um, thanks for listening. Take care of yourselves and be well. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the Wu style of Taiji Chen. Um, so the Wu style of Tai Chi Chen comes from one of the students of the creator of Tai Chi, Yang Lu Chan, as we talked a lot about. His student, his name, we call him Chuen Wu, is the one who took his teachers, his master's style, and created eventually what became known as the Wu style of Tai Chi Chen. So let's take a look at his biography. Um, we'll t- pull it from Combat Techniques of Tai Chi, Xing Yi, and Bagua by Lu Sheng Li, um, published in 2006. So he says, uh, <clears throat> when Yang Luchan taught Taiji Chuan in the Emperor's security guard camp, only three people thoroughly mastered his techniques. Those three students were Wan Chuan, Ling Shan, and Chuan Yu. Wan Chuan developed powerful internal force. Ling Shan was especially effective in his throwing skills. Chuan Yu was known for mastering the details of every technique, especially the most important Taiji Chuan skill, Ro Hua, the use of softness to defend against hard attacks. Um, Little is known today about the other two students because they did not teach very much and had no outstanding students who could inherit their techniques. Chuen Yu's group, however, was large and gave rise to a new style. So Chuen Yu eventually becomes known as Wu Chuen Yu down the road. So that's what we call Wu style. So he's born in uh, 1834 to a Manchurian family in Beijing. He liked martial arts and as a young man joined the Emperor's Security Guard where he studied with Yang Luchan. He practiced very hard, but like most people, he had trouble understanding Tai Chi Chen. One reason for this difficulty was that Yang did not like to reveal the details of his skills. After several years, Yang got sick and Chuen Yu nursed him faithfully back to health. Recognizing the compassionate and loyal nature of Chuen Yu's character, Yang Luchan began to teach him Tai Chi Chen skills in complete detail. Chuen Yu thought deeply about Tai Chi Chen principles and practiced hard, and so he advanced quickly and soon became very famous. You know, this style is kind of cool because it talks about uh, Tai Chi's or, or, or origin in the King's Bodyguard special security detail. Well, this guy was the best one of the security guards. So that's kind of a cool origin for your martial arts style to come out of the best of the best from the Emperor's, uh, you know, elite security team. And, uh, you know, a lot of the other students were like sons of Yang Luchan or whatever and uh, cousins and stuff and sort of people who learned, but they weren't necessarily known to be part coming from the bodyguard side of it. And that's where Wu Chuen Yu gets his start as the top fighter in this security detail. Right. I mean, it's the same dynamic <clears throat> that we saw with like Yang Luchan and with Dong Hai Chuan where you get the, you get the official position in the government job and then that sort of kicks off your career as like the you know the guy the guy for martial arts <clears throat> right and a lot of Dong Chuan students were from after he left the palace only a few of his students were from inside the palace and I think the same goes for Tai Chi right like 
Wu style is the one that comes out of the palace. The other ones are people that learned from the sons. You know what I mean? They mm-hmm. weren't necessarily mm-hmm. yeah. involved in security work for the emperor or whatever. It says that uh, because Chen Yu was Manchurian, and at that time Yang Luchan was the king's uh, martial arts master, Yang could not accept Chen Yu as a disciple. According to Manchurian custom, Chen Yu was considered a slave of the king and had to refer to King Duan as his master. Jesus. If Yang accepted him as a disciple, he would then become the king's kung fu brother, an unthinkable breach of convention, right, so he right, couldn't right. rise him up. So instead, Chen Yu and the other two uh, top students became Yang Ban Ho's disciples. The son of Yang Luchan. So even though he was equal to Yang Ban Ho, he's bowed to the son in order to avoid an unthinkable breach of etiquette and avoid becoming the king's school brother, which could get you killed, basically. It says that uh, Chen Yu died in 1902. So only two years after the Boxer Rebellion... Uh, Chen Yu dies. So he's really from the 1800s generation, big time. I think Yan Ban Ho is primarily 1800s guy as well. So it says, after the Republican Revolution, Chen Yu's family adopted Wu as its family name. And the style of Taiji trend developed by this group became known as Wu style. So that's where the Wu comes from after 1912. Right, they Manchurians changed, their, adopted, changed their name uh, to like be more politically correct. Or basically, yeah, to fit in. Um, so it says that, uh, Chen Yu's son was born in 1870. He studied Taiji Chen with his father from an early age, practiced hard and grew into a fine man. After the revolution, he adopted the Chinese name of Wu Jian Chen and dedicated his life to teaching Taiji Chen. Until 1928, he taught in Beijing, where Wu and many other Tai Chi masters practiced together and did careful research into the principles and techniques of Taiji Chen. So he lists the other guys that uh, Wu Jian Chuan was friends with, including, uh, you know, there's guys here that I've seen their names, but I don't know exactly who they are. Uh, but one name that he mentions is Liu Dequan, mm-hmm. the great Bagua master, who was, uh, you know, uh, what would you say? He was an inspiration and mentor to Liu Hong Jie's teacher, Liu Zhen Lin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so no, I wonder I was, if that's how that Wu Jian Chuan connection got made. Well, I've seen, so this is... Some a lot of names, but Gengji Xing, the famous Xing Yi master, had a school and sort of a gathering place, mm. and a lot of famous masters went there, including Wu Jin Chuan. I mean, basically, I can just anybody you can think of you've ever heard of. Yeah, has been the, there. The, this guy. I mean, it was like the kind of. I mean, the way I picture it, it was just a bunch of old guys sitting around, you know, drinking, smoking, doing martial arts, and you know complaining about everyone else is doing it wrong yeah yeah but but it was but he was you know Gengji Sheng was known as a very kind of open guy yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so Sun and, Ludong type of guys were coming through there those guys who wanted to connect everyone yeah kind of. uh Gengji Sheng is Rose Lee's grand teacher and Rose Lee's famous in England right one so of her, her early her, her internal martial arts her teachers. Xingyi teacher learned from Gengji Sheng right um and you know he so was, maybe that's where Wu Jian Chuan Liu Dequan um Get, you know that that connection gets made, and later Liu Hongjie, who's you know Kumar Francis's teacher, who we profiled a bunch, he ends up getting an introduction to Wu Jian Chuan, and maybe that's from his friends in the Bagua world who I connected think it was, to Liu yeah, Dequan. Definitely from this sort of you know think, community in the, Beijing. And the story was that he wasn't too interested in Tai Chi because he spent his whole youth doing Qingyi and Bagua, and then only when he met Wu Jian Chuan, he's like, okay, this there's something to this, right? And, so and he, he was also with it, you know in his mid 40s at that mm. point or whatever so i think tai you know, chi is more interesting yeah you might 40s. you know as you get older tai chi starts to have a little more appeal I think. right absolutely so it says that uh so then it mentions 1928 so that's that's the year that's man. a pivotal year yeah right a lot of historical things are happening in china a lot of wars and battles the 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 uh the period of the warlords is coming to an end the period of invasion by Japan is coming up. Like, this is this key moment. Liu Hongjie always uses that as the dividing line when the golden age of martial arts ends at that, kind of at that year. Well, right, there was a blip there for a moment where everything was kind of in... At least from the... There was hope, mar- anyways. <laughs> yeah, at least from the martial artist's point of view, there was a little bit of a glimmer of like, oh, maybe we'll actually be able to, you know, 
keep this going and mm -hmm. it didn't last but you know there was right. kind of there was you know the big tournament that we always talk about was in 1928 right. and that was considered to be like the you know the apex of the whole like oh look at chinese uh, martial funny. arts as a you know cultural and phenomenon and, and as a that. combat basis phenomenon you know like it was that was kind of the last gasp though after yeah, that point fire, the superlative right. th the guys of the 1800s after that are going to be right, gone the, the firearms thing yeah. is already the world of the 1800s is fading and fading and fading and 1928 is kind of like the end of it all those mm -hmm. old guys are kind of gone for at sure that point. yeah um, so it says at that point, he, he had been teaching in Beijing up until that point. Um, so eventually, uh, so he go at that point, he goes to Southern China to teach Taiji. And in 1935, he established the, uh, Jianquan Taiji Chen school in Shanghai. Uh, he died in Shanghai seven years later. So that's the Shanghai side of the Wu family, right? The sort of Southern Wu, um, group, you know, so to speak. Um, and so he says, Wu Jianquan passed away. His son's daughter and students continued to teach Wu style in Shanghai and abroad. Um, one of the sons taught in Hong Kong in 1948, and Wu style soon became famous in Southeast Asia and in North America. So the three major groups of Wu style practitioners are in Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. Yeah, and you can see it in the forms. I mean, there's not that much difference, but there are kind of distinct differences between the sort of regional branches of the Wu style just there the same way there are with the Yang style but I think with the Wu there just aren't as many you know branches so it's a little easier to identify which version they're doing but right and so to learn a little bit more about uh Chuen Yu the founder of this Wu style Taiji Chuen I uh was searching the internet and found something off the Christ-centered Neijia page so they start by saying, Chuen Yu was one of the very best martial artists of his time as a member of the Manchurian Imperial Guards. He specialized in short weapons, and he was especially skilled in sword. He had the characteristics of softness in appearance and strength on the inside, and he loved to help people in their time of need. Legendary stories have been passed down from earlier generations tell us that Chuen Yu had both high skills of martial arts ability and virtue true of martial art. He was a generous man with moral concepts melded into his skills. He never used his strength against weak people, but instead always showed his kindness to others. Chuen Yu is known to have punished those who were evil and has done injustice to others, and a brave man who was always ready to help the needy. One day, Chuen Yu walked into the farmer's market when he saw a soldier take food from a vendor and then not want to pay the merchant. When the vendor asked the soldier to pay him, the soldier started to beat the small man. Chuen Yu came up to stop the soldier. The soldier thought Chuen Yu looked too gentle to know how to fight, so he threw a punch and followed with a, quick, followed with a kick. The soldier suddenly found that he himself was like a praying mantis trying to knock down a tree, and he fell to the ground without Chen Yu having moved an inch. Chen Yu told the soldier that one should never use his martial skills to mistreat innocent people. Hmm. What about that? Virtuous right. story? Yeah. Chen Yu standing up for the little guy. See? He's got a good rep. <clears throat> All right, so the next one. In Chen Yu's time, martial artists often challenged each other with or without notice. Among these men, due to its softness, the Wu style was often mistaken as a weak martial art. One afternoon, Chuen Yu was reading in his room when he was informed that an unknown guest had come to him. Chuen Yu came to the courtyard to greet the man. The guest lowered his body as if to bow to Chuen Yu, and Chuen Yu returning the salute. But at that moment, the guest was suddenly up in the air, falling backwards and landing outside the guest room door. All the people in the room were shocked by this surprise exit. But the truth was that the guest had used a martial technique known as the steel fist to attack, attack Chuen Yu when he was pretending to bow. Chuen Yu had in turn used the Taiji Chuen skill of neutralization and redirecting power from the guest to efficiently combine defense and offense. So, so there you go. Wanted. So the story is always that Tai Chi looks weak, but then when you put it into action, it's actually quite effective. Soft on the outside, hard on the inside. There you go. Once again, the classics are proven true. So it says a little more of the history that the other book had um, <clears throat> mentions the different had the, the different schools of of Chen Yu's group. Um, Wu style Taiji Chen developed into two branches in Beijing: one from the earlier students of Chen Yu, and the other from the students of Wu Jian Chen. Wu Jian Chen modified the forms taught to him by his father. He utilized a narrower circle and created many new ways to apply the form in a practical manner. 
Um, so it says that he teamed up with Yang Shaoho and Yang Cheng Fu. The, oh, the the son, Master Wu Jian Chuan, t- teamed up with Yang Shaoho and Yang Cheng Fu, or kind of his generation guys. They founded a famous martial arts school um, and made it possible to teach to the general public for the first time. Um, so there you go. A couple stories about the life of a great master. Now let's return to our discussion of the Tai Chi classics, according to Bai Hua, in his book, Uncovering the Secrets of Internal Power in Tai Chi Chen. So we've, uh, we've been working our way through the uh, Tai Chi Chen treatise. And here's the next section. Do not sway your body slantingly. The force should be unpredictable, making the opponent unable to guess. So he goes on to explain it like this. Where there is pressure, there is the center point of pressure. That is the Dantian. The Dantian should not be distorted by external influences. Otherwise, that will affect the initiative because there's no Zong Ding or central channel and the waist cannot be properly weighted to control the whole body movement. Only by mastering these requirements can the inner force, Jin, be free to do what one wants, sometimes hidden inside, sometimes appearing outside, coming and going without a trace, leaving the opponent uh, unable to predict your movements. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So do not sway your body slantingly. So it's saying, don't lean. That's one of the Tai Chi right. prescriptions. I mean, it's pretty, pretty kind of basic on one level of saying just like, don't distort your physical structure essentially so leaning is one part of it but i mean it's also collapsing your body mm. or you know sticking your chest out mm. these are all you know, protuberances yeah yeah yeah. there's all you know there's deficiencies lean, you know. so and <clears throat> the extension of that is if you are able to keep yourself from leaning and you know losing that structure you have this ability to kind of be unpredictable because mm. you're hard to read essentially right? right because if nothing's coming out of you in an obvious way the person across from you can't tell what right. you're going to do if you're you know if you're telegraphing your punch right. really, i think that's what it is you, yeah you know it's really too easy to see what's coming out of you right because right? you can sway and slant yourself if you choose to it just don't habitually have a tell like that where you tend to lean one way or the other out of habit like you should be able to move yourself wherever you need to. And if you need to sway, go for it. But not just as a habit that the other person can take advantage of. Right. And that's where the next thing he talks about, the Zhang Ding, comes into it. Which is a huge subject. But in a, in a sense, it's the sensual equilibrium. Balance, right? So, it's e- most easily attained if your body is actually physically straight and vertical. Right? Like, that you're not bending and you're not leaning, essentially. Once you attain the, the sensual equilibrium, you can do whatever the hell you want with your body and you'll still be able to, you know, pretty much keep it together. But there's a um, a training that has to go into it. And so the, the idea that, that, you know, what you're trying to do initially is everything that you do has to be connected to your waist via this central channel, this Zhong Ding, right? Right. So, I mean, this is kind of the um, major structural thing in Tai Chi because it, it it's hard to get used to the idea of if someone pushes on me, I'm just going to kind of put my arm up and relax and I'm not going to mm-hmm. push back or brace myself or do anything. I'm just going to use my natural structure that I've developed from, you know, practicing keeping my structure and that's going to, you know, stop the person and neutralize them so that seems to connect with what he says when there is pressure when there is pressure there is the center point of pressure that is the dantian so someone could shove your dantian or knock it out of place and uproot you and and screw up your balance then your your central alignment is no longer right and he's not saying dantian as the center point in your belly He, he previously talked about how the dantian is the entire center essentially that that you know the one as he called it right so the the as we would we would call it your center of gravity basically right but that can that can move inside your body so it's not a fixed point that he's talking about he's saying essentially wherever they apply pressure that becomes the center hmm. right the way bruce explained this is that um when you push on someone right their their center becomes the thing they can't move 
right? So it's like, it could be their shoulder, it could be their hip, right? But the, the quote unquote center that you're pushing on is the thing they can't move. So, you know, flip that around. When they push on you, you want it to be that, you know, you can move everything and you have this, you know, this central connection, right? This, hmm. this Zhong Ding. So it's, you know. And that way, and then next he talks about the waist. Um, so, you know, Tai Chi has this big thing about not being double weighted and how the movement of the waist is like commands the body. Um, it's the, it's the pivot by which you can move all the rest of the body. So when someone controls your Dantian, they control your waist. Again, there's a whole cascade of things that happen. Just don't let your opponent get their force right. onto I mean, you. Basically the idea is if, if they get your center, you can't really use mm-hmm. your waist effectively. Right. Yeah. So if basically if you're falling over, turning your hips isn't going to do much. Pretty much. Right? You have to be rooted and connected for your, you know, your turning and all your, you know, techniques to actually work. And then finally he talks about inner force, Nei Jin, that uh, can, is free to do what one wants, sometimes hidden inside, sometimes appearing outside, coming and going without a trace. So that's that. I mean, my sense is that that's that ability to have Fa Jin, where any any point someone hits you, you can retaliate from any direction. Basically, you don't have to like yeah, punch I mean, straight ahead it, necessarily. It's that, and it, I mean, it's it's a number of things, but it, it's essentially the idea that underneath this still external structure that mm. you're presenting, you have everything moving and swirling and undulating, and you know, so that like when you actually need the thing to come out. It comes out instantly and unpredictably, right? So it's not, again, it's it, you're not telegraphing your punch. Not winding up a big haymaker right. it's here. It's just instantly there when it needs to be there. It's so like, think about Tai Chi. Someone shoves you in the chest and your hands fly up with uh, with the opening posture. That's an example of how the mm-hmm. Neijin could emerge. Or even before, the they, even before they get to you, you just kind of catch the fact that they're coming towards you and you use that moment, you know, you sort of match their momentum and you catch them right as they're coming towards you. I mean, that'd be a classic Tai Chi way to apply this, yeah. this I mean, inner force. You know, it's, it's what Aikido tries to do. It's, you know, I mean, it's what any quote unquote soft martial art is, mm-hmm. is looking for is that sweet <clears> spot where, you know, just as they try to apply force, you mm. slip out of the way. And the more kind of, they think they've got it, the yeah. more... And they can... sort of fall, and then you catch them when they're falling. And it's kind of like... Again, I mean, the 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 thing of, you know, if, if you're trying to catch someone else's equilibrium being off, you know, the more you have yours, it's like theirs seems, you know, even the smallest you know increment of being out out of place to you seems big right mm. so you can manipulate the person just a tiny little bit get that jong ding and then boom and you're off to the next guy right. you don't have to you know duke it out with each person because you're able to just get right to the thing that you know essentially their spine and you know that's the dream it. come true i mean it reminds me of those early stories earlier about wu jian chuan and chuan ru where they, they looked very unassuming and it's that that's that Tai Chi strategy of you're not giving away anything, you're not telegraphing anything, you're totally unpredictable, and then your power can come out any di- different direction that you might want to use it. Yeah, I mean that that story that we just told about the guy bowing and then you know trying, right. trying to take a cheap ah, shot. I mean, that's right. that's the perfect you know if where nobody even sees the guy doing the attack, right. they just see the you know him getting flung. Maybe it was Chen Yu who did the cheap shot. Right, and he I said, mean, "Hey, he was going to attack me." I was wondering about that too, but you know. <laughs> Nobody was looking since give a shot. Strike first, ask questions <laughs> right. later, right? Sometimes that's what it takes. I okay, guess so why don't we move on to the next quote here? So the next one is translated as follows. If I feel the weight on my left side, I will not fight against him from my left side. If I feel the weight on my right side, I will conceal the weight on my right side so that the opponent cannot attack me. So he gives a... A little breakdown here. So the concept of solid and looseness of Tai Chi Chen is divided by weight and strength. In any part of the body, solid and looseness must exist at the same time. The loose has the solid, the solid has the loose. Otherwise, it will not reflect the unity of yin and yang in the diagram of Tai Chi, and there will be no change at all. And then he goes on to give an example of uh, 
you know, lunging to punch and exert the force where the weight is, where the emptiness is. So yeah, again, there's that, that dichotomy of one of how do you balance this solidity and looseness in this case, um, the, the yin and the yang and, and like, and he's concerned that if you don't balance it properly, there won't, it won't be able to change. It'll be kind of stuck. Maybe. How do you interpret that? Yeah. Well, the, the way this is usually translated is either substantial and insubstantial or empty and full, right? right. That you have two, you know, you have opposites, right? Mm -hmm. So the first part about the weight and the strength, one side of your body has your weight, right? Your, your front leg say has your weight, your back legs leg is going to have the energy. It's going to have the, the, the power coming from that. Gene right. Force. So, you know, I mean, as far as empty and full goes, it, it's a pretty like, it starts with the idea of just having it where you're always changing from one side to the other mm. so you're not pushing with like air, you know it's like not binary it's always got this yin and yang it's like if you're in a deep horse stance and you try to push you're going to knock yourself over because you're well not i mean shifting your weight as you do it in a sense it's to differentiate between like a shaolin thing where you might hit with both fists at the same time or like you know there's a double whip right in, in Shaolin where both hands whip at the same time in Tai Chi you do a single whip where you know one and the other and the idea is that you're always kind of again just circulating between yin and yang you're not doing a yang and then a yin it's like there's one and the other so and ultimately they're within each other kind of he said well they're in, interchanging i mean so it's yeah it's like it never completes itself really it's always going back and forth so you know the the basic thing is that if you can get this empty and full you don't get stuck because mm. if you're sort of in the middle there's a tendency to get stuck like just in terms of weight shift if your weight shifts all the way and you have one leg is fully weighted and one leg is empty, that empty leg can move without having to do any, you know, there's no gap in between mm. essentially. So that's kind of the main thing. And then in terms of your arms, it's about, I mean, there's a lot of things, but one of them is you take the movement G, for example, your forward arm is the one that's contacting the person is the, that's the yin one. The one that's coming behind is the yang one. So mm -hmm. the, the the pushing is coming from the rear leg and the rear hand. Mm -hmm. The front foot and the front hand are just there to support it, right? So they're the that that's the yin supporting the yang, the yang powering the yin, this whole, you know, thing. So it's just, you know, using these principles and how that manifests in your body and um Yeah, it's just one of those like ways you keep your body balanced yeah there's just an emphasis that you always are able to change and never get stuck and that's that's a big theme in internal martial arts that they're constantly harping on as the worst thing is to freeze up and be unable to move and affect the situation right and the the, the if i feel pressure on my right side i you know whatever yield the, basically, the idea is if they push on your right arm, you don't resist with your right mm. arm. You let your right arm relax and you return the push with your left, right? Mm. You, really can either, you can either push, you know, separately with your left or you can push through that right arm. I mean, mm. it's, you know, again, that's where you're just going to use different techniques, Pong or G or, you know, whatever. Right. You use this, this technique that's specific to that, but you don't oppose force with force being kind of the key Right, so that's where he says, you know, it's the emptiness of true force, right? So, like, you, that once you get this thing, there's no um, lead, there's no external strength needed to, to do it because you're able to just connect to this, the, the jing, right? The, the energy that's going on through your body. So, makes it easier in a sense. And here's a one I might I wanted to bring up um, one of our uh, one of our listeners wrote in about weight shifting and you know where what when do you use 60 40 and 70 30 and 100 zero and how a, a whole bunch of different schools approach it differently um, and different trends in Chinese martial arts at time periods or different schools is like promoting it as this is the best way or the worst way um, 
I guess my sense is every different weight position has its use. It's just if you make a habit of it, someone could catch you doing that and your opponent could could see, oh, he tends to lean on his right side when he steps forward. So I'm going to sweep his leg right when he steps. You got to keep stay crafty with it, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons for it. But I mean, as I understand it, the the simplest argument for doing the 100-0, which is the true empty and full, right, is... If you can do that, doing a 60-40 or a 70-30 is easy, right? If you can only do a 60-40 and you can't actually do 100-0, you got, you, got you got a deficiency somewhere that you're not actually addressing, right? So it's kind of a training yeah. so axiom. If you, all, all right, right man. Good deal. Talk to you soon. Bye. Hey, folks. Uh, just a quick reminder to check out the Instagram for images to go along with the episodes as well as our Facebook uh page if you want to listen to the episodes on facebook and again check out the patreon for the extended episode and bonus episodes and a special episode this week we're going to be releasing a portion of an interview that we did with marnix wells marnix was uh, bruce's classmate in taiwan in the late 60s uh and early 70s so you definitely want to check that out Thanks for listening and take care of yourselves.